How should we comfort ourselves? The murder of all murders, what was mightiest and holiest that the world has ever known, has bled to death under our knives. Who will wipe this blood off us? What water is there to clean ourselves? That was written by Friedrich Nietzsche in 1882 and again in 1884 in two of his books, Thus Spoke Zarathustra and The Gay Science. And when he wrote that, he didn't necessarily mean that God was dead. What he meant was that Western Europe was relying too much on science. There was a loss of a higher moral authority. And he feared that if that would occur, there would be chaos and nihilism. And there would be no compass for Europeans and for the world to follow. I went to go visit Nietzsche's home two weeks ago. And I spent some time there. So I wanted to learn more about this man, why he wrote this. Because I see a potential correlation with neurotoxins and fillers. Could the beginning of the end be happening right now with fillers and neurotoxins? What's growing so fast and what's so popular, what brings us all together, could we be seeing the beginning of the end? In the US, non-surgical cosmetic treatments exploded over a two decade period of time. Over 600% increase but it's plateaued, it's slowed down, it's still growing, but not at the same rate. It's dropped over 20 times. Why? Why is that rate dropping? What is the reason why people are less likely to, to be attracted to neurotoxins and fillers? This is where Nietzsche wrote. This is in Sils Maria in Switzerland, the Swiss Alps. So I, this is where he uh, lived. This is the room he wrote in. And I got an opportunity to spend some time right there, in front of him. And I really enjoyed learning more about what he said. But there's something that I started thinking about. Saturation points. And I asked some of my friends this question, because we all know about saturation points. We know when an enzyme saturates its receptor, you can't, you can't provide any more uh, product, and there's no better benefit. So I asked my qu a question, what in life what in life does not have a saturation point? Is there anything you can think of that doesn't have a saturation point? A point at which there's no greater benefit. And when you get to a certain point, you start to get negative consequences. Is there anything in life that doesn't reach a saturation? Everything to me eventually reaches a saturation. So I asked my friends this question because I was interested. Now if I asked you that question, what in life can you never have too much of? You can have too much food, get sick, and too much to drink. <clears throat> but when I ask my friends, what can you not have too much of? I always got the staple answers. Money, <clears throat> sex, love, and happiness. But I would argue you could have a little too much of all those things, except for maybe love. Maybe there's no end to love. Maybe there's no saturation. It keeps getting better and better. So that, I'll take that argument. But other than that, I can't think of anything that doesn't reach a saturation point and nothing gets better. What about in aesthetics? Many people want to do aesthetic medicine. I train at the university. I have many fellows, residents, medical students coming through my office. They all want to learn aesthetics. And they keep coming, doctor, can you teach me how to do a better injection technique? Can you teach me where to put the filler? They keep coming and asking, and they all want to do it. Why do you want to do it, I ask them. It's not necessarily for money. It's not for money. I think the reason why people really like aesthetics is because it gives you that doctor-patient relationship. A patient comes to you because they want you, and you have to win them over. It's a very strong, intimate relationship, which that is being lost in a lot of other aspects of medicine. So many people want in in aesthetics, but not everyone. Not everyone can be an aesthetic provider, just like not everyone can be a NASA astronaut, a Navy SEAL, or an Olympic athlete. If you want to be one of these people, the best of the best, which really is where I think aesthetic medicine is, it's not for everyone. It takes an enormous amount of skill, technical skill with your hands, artistic skill, and a skill of affability, to be nice, to understand that doctor-patient relationship and retail. You have to know how to sell without overselling people and taking advantage of them because you have a responsibility, a fiduciary responsibility to always do the right thing. It's very hard to be a very talented aesthetic physician when you put all this together. 
And not everyone can do it. I have many people come to my office, these, these young residents come in, I give a needle in their hand, and their hands are shaking, and they just will never be good at it. I have other people that are the, the opposite. They're, they're very, very nice, or they're very mean, and they're great with their hands, and they still won't be able to do it. Those of you who train, especially those who train surgeons, you can tell right away who's gonna have good hands and who isn't. Now, you can learn to be adequate, but the best of the best is few. It's few, it takes an enormous amount of skills that have to come together. I would argue it's about three standard deviations, about the 1.2% of those who really wanna do it get to that level. But we keep training, and training, and training. And I think that's good, because we need providers who are, who are better, but we keep training everyone, the masses, and masses of people. I go to conferences, and there may be 500 people in a hotel room all learning how to do neurotoxins and fillers. But I'm not sure they're learning how to do it the right way. Because as we keep training and training, we get something that happens. We get a regression to the mean. All of us know that in science, there's regression to the mean. You do too much of something, everyone comes to the center. And the mean outcome now in aesthetic medicine, the mean outcome is not something that's good. It's an unnatural result. This is the mean outcome. Because when we keep training and training and training, and not everyone is doing it appropriately or the best in the nature, the mean becomes an unnatural result. And where this hurts us is that patients are out there today, if you ask them, can you tell if someone's had neurotoxins or fillers? Can you tell if someone's had a facelift? Can you tell? They say, yes, of course, I can always tell. I'm like, no, you can't. They go, yes, I can always tell. I can tell if someone's had those treatments. I don't want them because I'm afraid I'm gonna look like that. That's the part you don't hear about. Because if you're in your clinic, people come to you. But there's masses of people out there who are considering plastic surgery or aesthetic medical treatments, but they don't come in. Why don't they come in? That number has not decreased. They're still sitting out there thinking about it, but they're not coming in. A survey was done by the Facial Plastic Society this year, and the number one reason the concern that patients had was looking unnatural. I have to fight that every single day. My, when a patient walks in, they sit down next to me, but doctor, I don't want to look strange. I don't want to look like those people in Hollywood. I don't want to have big lips. I want to look like me. They're all voicing something that they want that we're not giving them. We're not giving them those results that they're asking for because we're overdoing them. We're mistreating them, not because we don't, but not because we want to, because we don't know how to. I'm talking about the whole aesthetic industry, and it's affecting us now because you're seeing a blunting of the growth of neurotoxins and fillers. I think it's because we are producing unnatural results. Not every single one of us in this room. I'm saying the mass majority is the regression to the mean. The mean outcome is no longer a really good result. We teach unnatural. We don't teach, for the most part, how to make people look natural. We teach the opposite. And it's not our fault. It's not, in my opinion, bad doctors doing bad work. It's good doctors doing bad work because the way that we set up our criteria, two-point photo scales. A two-point photo scale is how we prove a product in the US. The FDA's got a two-point improvement in uh, neurotoxins in the upper two-thirds of the face. And if we're gonna do fillers, at least a one-point improvement, the nasal labial folds, on a photo scale, okay? So here's a patient in the study. If you look at her nasal labial folds, they look pretty good. They're filled in, that's a positive result. She gets a good result, she is a responder. She's a one-point improvement, nasal labial folds look good. But watch her in animation. And the second one? Twinkle, twinkle, little star. And then the third one? Little Bo Peep has lost her shape. Okay, and then can you pop her for me? Okay, smile real big. Okay, and can you state your full name? Do you see that right there? You don't see that until she animates. But these people smile and they don't have a complete smile. Her smile's a little off. But when you're looking at a static photo, it's a great result. It's a responder, it's a positive result. So we go out and we teach you how to get that result. But the reality is, is that result is not what the patients want. 
because it's a result with too much filler on nasal labial fold, it blunts the smile, and everybody can see it right away. Everybody can see that right away. It's too much filler. And even though it's a positive result. So evidence-based medicine, in the mid-90s, evidence-based medicine became very popular. <clears throat> and today, most of our medical journals are following evidence-based medicine, a criteria to validate the studies that we do. One of the most important developments in the last 100 years, according, in the last 15 years, according to the BMJ, British Medical Journal. So yes, it's great. We have evidence-based medicine. We're not going to have science that's from charlatans. We're not going to have science unless it's proven. But there's also a downside to evidence-based medicine. Now, I don't want to say that I'm against evidence-based medicine. I believe in evidence-based medicine. I sit on the journal boards of three major journals. I review studies every single week. Evidence-based medicine is critical. I've published many papers with very good evidence. But there's a downside to evidence-based medicine that you have to understand. One of the founders of evidence-based medicine mentioned the authoritative, the authoritative aura given may lead to major abuses that produce inappropriate guidelines or dogmas for clinical practice. Meaning that we've followed this evidence-based medicine and we think it's the end-all be-all. But we have to realize that science <laughs> is just one more approach to the truth. And sometimes science blinds us. Sometimes we hide behind science. And we don't see practicality when all we look at is science. And I know it's a bold statement, but I'm starting to see that more as I get higher and higher up into the into the publishing world. You have to realize when evidence-based medicine is out there, who's publishing it? Who publishes evidence-based medicine? If it's an academic person, they have an agenda, of course. Everyone's got an agenda when they publish, one way or another. They have a purpose for it. Either they want to train the community, but if you're, evidence, if you're uh, an academic, your capital is not money, it's your influence, and it's how many papers you publish. If you're a bureaucrat, you're looking for policy decisions, then you can then take care of reducing costs to delivering healthcare. And if you're an industry, you want FDA approval. You want approval of your product. So evidence-based medicine is sponsored and supported and written by people who have a reason for getting that study published. That's okay, I don't have a problem with it. I just wanna be honest with what we're doing and just look at it through that prism, through that veil, that someone's writing that article with the thought in mind. And if we recognize that sometimes too much science can narrow our thinking, I think it's an appropriate way for us to look at what we're doing right now and how there's a negativity to too much science. I know that goes completely across how we feel. We're physicians, we're doctors, we're science is at the core, it's at the crux of what we do. It's the reason why healthcare has advanced so much. But we have to realize that at any time you swing too far one way, thesis, antithesis, synthesis, too far one way, you start to get blinded to what goes on in the middle, to the practicality. And what I'm talking about is a creativity. Evidence-based medicine, in my opinion, doesn't take into account the creativity that goes into aesthetic medicine. If you look back at the history of medicine, it wasn't started by scientists. Philosophers, artists, and scientists were all one and the same. They came together. All of these famous people that we all know were all three. Democritus described the atom in 460 BC, well before science could prove it. Goethe, a romantic poet, also discovered the premaxillary bone. Voltaire was, an, was a mathematician, as was Descartes. Cartesian geometry is still followed today. All of these people were one-time philosophers, artists, and science. The American Philosophical Society was started by Benjamin Franklin, who also was a scientist. So philosophy, art, and science go together. When I was in college, I studied religion and philosophy. To this day, I still do. I enjoy it. But it also helps me to think creatively. Thinking creatively, I think, is critical to what we do. How important is thinking creatively to science? Nobel Prize winner.